Apple story is really touching. Kevin Rose had uh, some emails that he posted on his blog about, you know, it, it became that scene from the movie where everyone gathers around the electronics store and watches the TV broadcast, except for the modern era. Everyone was in the Apple store watching the live stream on the uh, laptops that they have set up there. Also, Facebook set up a Japan earthquake page for users to find information about disaster relief. Google has set up a crisis response project. We've talked about in the, that in the past, although an interesting spin on that, uh, Google is now encouraging people to take photos of the posters with people's names with their cell phones and send them uh, to an address tohoku.anpi.google at Picasso Web. Uh, and once sent, the photo will be automatically uploaded to the Picasso Web album uh, where people can, can view this and, and keep track of, of each other. Uh, NTT Docomo, Japan's largest wireless carrier, has set up a database where you can enter the cell phone number of a person to confirm his or her safety. Uh, so uh, just uh, you know, a lot of coming together of businesses, large and small, in, in this effort to try to help people out. Now, this is interesting. In the chat room, Stephen M. just tweeted or sent over to us that Verizon's offering free access to TV Japan through their Fios TV service. So and I think it's fascinating. Informed. Yeah, that's great. That we see, I think it's fascinating that we see uh, the, how the interconnectedness of our society nowadays not only makes possible massive amounts of relief. We saw with the Red Cross donations, it's so super easy just to donate over your phone, but also in prevention of disaster. There was a, a recent tweet from Scientific American saying, and I forget the number, it was millions or billions of dollars were saved by proper planning and preparation for the tsunami. And in a case where time is of the essence, once you have an earthquake and you need to get the word out that we expect a massive tsunami to happen and you've got to get to high ground, then it matters that all of a sudden everyone in the country is carrying on them a mobile device that keeps them interconnected with the rest of the whole freaking globe. Uh, it would be amazing. I'm sure some fascinating academic articles years from now will come out talking about how different technology has, has essentially shaped this disaster, both in the avoidance of it and in the recovery of it. And it's funny how copyright issues go away uh, when real important issues come along. For instance, TSS Aloic in the chat room points out NHK World is live streaming on Ustream right now. That'd be something they'd be sending a takedown notice for in the past. But we find out what's really important in these situations uh, and, and, and do what's necessary. Also, an uh, interesting thing on, on the... Uh, this is actually from Wired, uh, talking about some of the games that were supposed to come out. We, you, we see this happen a lot when natural disasters come along. Uh, games happen to have themes similar to the disaster, and everyone pulls them back. It's not censorship. It's just saying, you know what, this is not the it's right good time taste. Uh, what they for like this. To so, IRM will cease development on its PlayStation game, Zetai Zetsume Toshi 4, uh, City in a Desperate Situation. Uh, and there are a few other PS3 games that are being delayed for release because they de they deal with earthquakes and disaster themes. And I, I think that's appropriate. I mean, I think they they come under criticism for the opposite if they put them out for, for being insensitive and trying to profit at something like that. Oh, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, let's face it, the reason these games are popular is because we're all fascinated with massive disasters. But then when one happens, especially when it's when it's all too real... Uh, we certainly want to dial back our, our involvement. We saw that with 9-11. They pushed back the movie and made some changes to the movie Collateral Damage. And uh, what's funny is the little ways. There was a uh, an on-campus cafe called Ground Zero out in uh, uh, Eastern New Mexico University that uh, all of a sudden they were not real happy with that name. And likewise, the band Anthrax for a while, not happy with their name during that scare. And uh, when I went to Whole Foods to get sushi, it was very weird to grab a box of sushi that said tsunami package. And I was like, that's yeah. not cute right now. That's, yeah. uh, that's a major disaster. And, it, and it's just coincidence it's just it's just you know they, these these things aren't planned that way but then they strike us uh that way finally uh before we get to some of the user feedback from listeners uh there's a lot of discussion on the internet today about radiation risks about what's happening at the nuclear reactors in japan uh and i want to point to maggie kurth baker's po post at boing boing uh she says she's in the process of putting together a longer post that will add some con context to the concept of radiation, but she did actually, uh, she's like, the nuclear scientists are a little busy right now. They're, they're not responding to my emails because I'm not a priority, but she actually did get some, uh, some good information from Dr. Catherine Higley, uh, head of Oregon State University's Department of Nuclear Engineering and Radiation Health Physics. 
uh, and says that information keeps changing from the Fukushima power plant as the situation changes, but one plant worker received a 10 rem dose. That's twice the annual occupational dose, twice what regulators have deemed safe for someone who works in a nuclear power plant. Now, the interesting thing about this, you may think, wow, twice the dose, that's horrible. But that risk translates into a 1% increase into having some sort of cancer or some sort of health risk related to that radiation. So twice the radiation does not mean twice the risk. Obviously, it raises your risk, but 1%, actually 0.5 to 1% is a lot different. So I, I like, Boing Boing is doing a great job, by the way, of covering this and trying to bust through the FUD and say, you know, this is real. Uh, this is this is the PR that you're getting. This is what seems to be really happening on on all sides of the issue, not just like, you know, busting the FUD of, of the power plant, trying to contain the information about what's really happening, but also trying to to bust through, you know, people overreacting to the radiation issue. Radiation right. is a bad thing. I mean, I'm not saying it's OK, but you need to have some accurate sensibility about how bad it is in order to accurately estimate how bad the problem is. Well, let me tell you, if you want to immediately cut past anyone's logic circuits and immediately make them scared, just mention nuclear radiation because it's so counterintuitive. It's this thing you can't see, touch, smell, or perceive in any way that can kill you. Nuclear fallout, of course, is a real problem. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, in, and this is in no way meant to downplay the danger of the situation, but as people start throwing around the word Chernobyl, People really start to get worried, uh, and uh, I, I want to point people to, there's a fantastic speech by Michael Crichton uh, that you can find on YouTube. I believe it's called Fear and Complexity, uh, and he talks about how he wanted to create a global disaster, so he looked up some research on Chernobyl. The initial estimates at the time were that 2,000 people died at the accident and that upwards of 400,000 people died through later complications because of exposure to radiation and cancers and that kind of thing. As he dug into the numbers, uh, the actual numbers turned out that around 50 people died during the actual disaster, most of whom, about 30 of them, were fighting the fire live on the scene, and that's where, that's where they died. And that long-term cancers and infertility rates um, were such that basically only 4,000 to the day. Now, of course, the speech was written a, a while ago, and uh, of course, there's some fact-checking to be done on that. But that is a massive difference from a perceived disaster to the actual number. And the one thing he points out that blew my mind was that the World Health Org Organization did a study on what the biggest impact of, uh, of Chernobyl was, and they concluded that the number one negative impact of Chernobyl was not the radiation exposure, it was the perception of being told that you're going to die young, that you're going to be infertile, you can't have children, and that you, you've got nothing to live for. That's what caused the suicides and the early death rates and the uh, unemployment and the, and the malnutrition. Uh, and in this case, it wasn't that they were given bad radiation, they were given, given bad information. And yeah. as, we, as we do our next flirtation with this, it'll be interesting to see how our hyper-connected society a lot tells the story of, of this potential nuclear disaster. And it's actually the same issue we run in and talking about politics. You run in and talking about radiation, where if you start to say, look, it's not as bad as they're saying, all of a sudden people say, so you're saying radiation is fine. So you're saying there's no risk. And that's not true. That is not what we're no. saying at all. Not at all. Uh, not but at all. there is, you know, trying to find out what is the actual risk. There is a risk, but it doesn't, it's not helpful to say like, it's radiation and therefore everyone's going to die. Uh, right. Because that doesn't fact, help it's understand not it either. Helpful. It's actively harmful. I mean, scientists are very familiar with something they call the nocebo effect. It's a negative placebo. They call it the death bone, the death rattle, where somebody points to you, they give you the evil eye, they say you're going to die, and people, sure enough, die. And so it's important that uh, for, for the maximum health of society that we be smart, that we avoid the radiation, that we handle the problem correctly, but that we not get wrapped up in this disaster um, explosion where we think that, that everything's over and it's the end of the days. And, and what, what you need to do is you need to actually find good sources of information. Leo and I are talking about uh, hopefully doing a triangulation uh, with some nuclear scientists who can actually tell us 
you know, what is happening, what are the dangers, what are the risks, what do people actually need to be worried about. Uh, in the meantime, you know, once you start to educate yourself on what, uh, you know, the damages, what the real damages of radiation, what the levels are to be worried about, there are a lot of great resources online right now for finding out what the radiation is, not only in Japan, but elsewhere in the world. A live Geiger counter is at alttokyo.com, updates a graph uh, with data every 60 seconds. There's also a Ustream channel broadcasting the digital display of another Tokyo Geiger counter. That's been uh, almost, that's been crashing. It's getting so many viewer emails. Uh, RadiationNetwork.com is a crowdsourced radiation monitoring network of roughly a dozen or so unofficial monitoring sites around the United States. So you got to take that into account. It's very low number, very unofficial, uh, but it's updated every three minutes. And you can participate in that by buying, you know, radiation detection equipment and going online. That's not something everyone's going to do. Uh, this, but if you're really into awesome. it, that's a great way to learn about stuff. This is the the bit torrenting of radiation research here. When all of a sudden everybody, for example, uh, their GeigerCounters.com is out of stock. They say due to the disaster in Japan, orders for Geiger counters has outstripped supply. This is fantastic. And again, it's a case where the hyper-connected society we live in make possible large-scale experiments and, and monitoring that never would have been possible even just 20 years ago during the Chernobyl disaster. All right, uh, let's Hi. let's move on to some of the uh, the first person accounts here. We got one voicemail to two six zero TNT show from Jason, telling us a little bit about what's going on in his area. Thanks so much for calling, Jason, and, and I'm glad to hear everything is is safe for you. I hope you stay safe. Uh, I, I play this also because it's a fascinating first person account, but also uh, it emphasizes the importance of being prepared. As, as any kind of disaster like this always does, you know, having your 72 hour plan for whatever it is in your area of the world, whether it's tsunamis or earthquakes or tornadoes uh, or hurricanes, uh, there, there's something dangerous. Maybe it's a snowstorm uh, that can happen, na some kind of natural disaster that you should you should be prepared for. And I, I think Jason is is a good reminder of that. Uh, and I tell you what, man, it's one of those things where it's very sobering when you think about how many things we totally take for granted. And even the nut jobs who, who for grins, want to get ready for a zombie apocalypse, in a bizarre way, I'm like, at least you guys are saving water and food. You 